I don't really know how to start shows. Come on now, don't start, don't start liking me now. So yeah, I'm funny compared to you. Know, well, you'll see later. I stand for my help. I know a lot of fucking idiots. I think a lot of shit is mean spirited just because it goes against what they believe. But the relief of comedy is it takes things that aren't funny and it allows us to laugh about them for an hour. We got a purple suit to buy and a gigantic <laughs> coffin. Why are you laughing? Evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Why Are You Laughing? A history of comedy podcast. And today, I am pleased to introduce to you Sinbad, uh, the king of the 90s, the, the funk master himself, Sinbad. Oh, women be shopping and we're going to talk about it uh, today on the program. Uh, Sinbad's an interesting case where I think he's both underrated, was very overrated in his time in some ways and is very underrated in his standing in the history of comedy. So we'll talk about all of that today. Uh, but first I do want to remind you guys, big news, dare I say, in the why are you laughing world where we're doing bonus episodes. So by the time you're listening to this for free, uh, new year's day, we will have posted Joe Matarese part two. So, uh, I know people seem to enjoy the Joe Matarese episode. So this time we are visiting the porcelain tapes, the three-part documentary series done on Joe Matteris and some of the things that went into that. So we're talking about that on the Patreon. Um, if you guys are interested in why you're laughing bonus content, we're going to be doing two extra episodes a month, I think is the plan. So pretty much every other week, more or less, you'll get a uh, bonus full episode of why you're laughing. Plus we'll do, uh, you know, mini episodes and reviews of specials and things like that. So um, you'll be getting a bunch more bonus content on the Patreon. Uh, that's for everyone $5 and up, by the way. So uh, subscribe at any tier, basically, except for you grandfathered in $1 people. Um, but yeah, subscribe to the Patreon. You can get that at blendmike.net is the easiest way to find it. And uh, even if you don't want to put money behind us, just support the show for free, quietly in the background, then uh, go ahead and do that. All the links are there, Spotify, Apple, YouTube, and, uh, you know, leave a five-star review, leave a comment, leave a like, subscribe. All that stuff helps the algorithm. So, uh, and tell a friend, you know, post it on Instagram that you're listening. I don't know. Whatever people do to get the word out there. Do that for us, if you would. Yes, TikTok trends, please. Hmm? Hmm? Yeah, post videos on TikTok. Hey, kids, look at this. I'm listening to Why Are You Laughing? Isn't this cool? Yeah, that's fun. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, make sure you do all of that if you'd be so kind. And speaking of cool, we got the coolest cat from the 90s, uh, hammer pants and all, Sinbad. And as Sinbad would tell you, actually, they became known, known as ham, hammer pants. Sinbad was wearing them first. That's how cool this guy was. <laughs> I mean, I mean, that's what I think of Pete Cool as hammer pants. <laughs> yeah. So Sinbad it kind of became... I think his name is kind of a punchline now in the comedy world where he became sort of a hack, but kind of like we talked about with Gallagher. Um, we've mentioned Carrot Top before, or even in certain ways, like when we talked about Dane Cook, it's like, I don't know, a hack to get to that level. Can you truly be a hack? You know, does it become a thing where other people are ripping you off <laughs> and it kind of becomes ha what you're doing becomes hacky because of that? Well, that was definitely um, the case with Dan Cook, for sure. All right, relax. <laughs> Craig always pipes in with a Dan Cook defense. Hey, but he, with he, Sinbad, I think it's a I think it's a little bit of both. I think he is a guy that did um, family friendly, very clean material. And I think because he got uh, kind of swept up like where he had most of his success was with he was, he was in kids movies. He'd make appearances on Nickelodeon and stuff like that. And I think it, but kind of, it kind of became in a, in the era of, you know, just after dice and Kinnison, uh, where Howard Stern was at his peak when, you know, like Jackass and Tom green started coming out American pie. Like when it became cool to be edgy in the nineties, Guys like Sinbad were looked at as, uh, you know, nerds for better or worse. So I think that had a big uh, part of it. But we'll, we'll talk about his early days to get started here. Um, he was basically 
uh, kind of a mess as a young man. He said he didn't quite have his life together. It seems like that was a trend throughout Sinbad's life. Um, he played basketball. I think the best way to describe his basketball talent was for a comic, uh, you know, in a comics league, he probably would have been the number one overall pick. Like, I don't think uh, his skills necessarily translated to the NBA or real competitive D1 or anything, but it seemed like he was a good basketball player. He was 6'5", and uh, he was recruited by some places. Um, so I think our first clip is him talking about that, right? Yep, college recruiting. All right, let's hear that. So when first I got to college, I I turned on these scholarships. My mama found these these scholarship offers in the trash. I had a dual engineering uh, scholarship too. I said, I'm gonna go to the University of Denver. It's always interesting when you hear guys, and there's a lot of them, particularly back in the day. I think stand up now is enough of a its own world where you don't have this as much. Like when you look at, you know, Mark Norman, Sam Marill, Joe List, guys like that, they you can tell they wanted to be stand ups and they loved stand up as kids and everything. Whereas, you know, seventies, eighties, even into the nineties, it was like I wanted to be an entertainer. As a lot of them wanted to be in sports, a lot of them wanted to be in music, a lot of them wanted to be actors. So it's always interesting to see the guys that originally set out to be like, I want to be in the, in the NBA because I think that does in a way translate to Sinbad's comedy career in the sense of, uh, I don't know that he ever wanted to be a prolific comedian. I think he wanted to be an entertainer in, in some form or fashion. So you get guys like that. And that's something I think Mencia had, I think Mencia wanted to be an entertainer. So he didn't give a fuck if he was stealing, not that Sinbad stole jokes or anything like that. But he didn't give a fuck about the, you know, how cutting edge the material was necessarily. He just wanted to go out and entertain people and make it worth a, you know, $50 ticket or whatever people were paying. <clears throat> yeah, there was, there was also a time, too, back then when, like, comics were almost looked at like carnies. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's still a little bit of that today, particularly at lower levels. You know, I mean, now there's a ton of comics selling out arenas and things like that. But at lower levels, it's amazing when you hear guys talk. Like, remember in the uh, Mitzi Shore episode when we discussed the strike that, you know, Letterman and Leno were kind of uh, heading? Yeah. When <clears throat> comics went on strike at the comedy store just to be paid a fair wage. And when you throw the numbers out from the 70s, it's still the same today where for spots they'll be getting, you know, $25. Like the money hasn't gone up because there's no, you know, sort of union or anything. There's no set ways to protect these guys. So club owners can kind of do whatever they want to them uh, in the early days. I am curious to see how Rogan's club gets ran. Cause he's like, I'm going to make sure it's, it's for the comics. He's doing it for the comic it, it, to the point where he's talking about it. He almost doesn't care if it makes money, <laughs> which, which would be which unbelievable. Will, yeah. At least at first. Cause the name recognition, I think they're going to get a lot of people in there, but I mean, yeah, he'll, he'll probably put, if they're doing, if they're still doing $25 spots, he'll probably do like 150, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, it'll be interesting. But uh, anyways, not to get too sidetracked. Yeah. So Sinbad was uh, originally, a basketball recruit, pretty good. Uh, like I said, I mean, I think for, you know, compared to us, <laughs> he'd be me and Craig in one-on-one, -on -one, I think. Probably two-on-one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so he talks a little bit more about that, and it goes to kind of him becoming a, a comedian, like these life experiences that drove him into comedy, where he had these paths he definitely could have gone down, but his his you know his own mind was so chaotic that he couldn't really focus on it. Yeah, I, I'm I'm mostly looking for. I I always think we think of Sinbad on Blind Mike Project. I don't know once or twice a year because of the. Oh well, we'll get to yeah. we'll get to the reason we think of that. Yeah, but... <laughs> so I'm I'm fascinated yeah. by this guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's had an interesting life. But yeah, let's hear about more about his uh his college days. But you, Man, were, you know, I'm gonna play pro basketball. It's pretty. I mean, it's pretty cool that he got to that level. I, I imagine those games with Larry Bird probably weren't too competitive. I don't. Yeah, I don't think he won. <laughs> but it's still, it's still pretty cool that he got to that kind of level, you know. But it's interesting to hear there where he's talking about his hops. He's talking about how high he can jump and everything. I think that's what fueled Sinbad, and it's probably the reason it's a type of comedy that I don't relate to. <clears throat> 
is like uh, the confident guy is very hard for me to to relate to. But that's something that Sinbad absolutely had, and I think it helped his style of comedy. But I think it also hurt his personal life when he gets into uh, some of the other trouble he's had throughout his life because you'll hear him in a lot of these interviews, and I think he's a little... Um, I don't know if delusional is the right word because he was extremely successful. He was humongous he, in the yeah. 90s. But he's, uh, yeah, so delusional is probably too strong, but his his grasp of his talents doesn't really, uh, he had a bit of an ego on him, I guess is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> like, I think he still looks at that as like, you know, like he played for Denver. It wasn't a very prestigious. I know he said he was recruited by Popovich, but I imagine the, talent pool that air force had to select from was different than, you know, Kentucky. Uh, so, you know, I don't know how good he was at basketball, but you hear him there. He's kind of, I think he kind of puts himself like I could have played against magic. No big deal. You know, <laughs> I, I, I took that as like uh, just so you know, I wasn't a bum. I did play yeah. against these people. Yeah. <laughs> there's some of that too. And I think that's something a lot of comics deal with where it's like, the, you know, you, you just want to be heard. And just, that's what drives you to comedy is like, I, I wasn't bad guys. Right. Like, look at this. <laughs> it was pretty good. Yeah. Um, so when uh, the basketball stuff failed, he kept going a wall from the uh, air force. It almost ended in a dishonorable discharge. And uh, that's when he set his sights for Hollywood and said, uh, I'm going to go do some comedy. And he was successful pretty early. Like, it's weird. I think we've talked about this before, but I think, you know, prior to all the cable stations and now streaming services and YouTube and all these outlets um, where people can post their own stuff. Uh, I think prior to that, it was both easier and harder in different ways. It was harder to become successful because, you know, there were three networks and then HBO, I guess, where realistically, you could get a big break on. Uh, and now obviously the options are a lot greater, but because things were so limited, like if you just got in, you were golden. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like at that time, I think it, there was a lot more of like, it's not uh it's not what you know, it's who, you know, sort of a thing. Like if you just get in, you're going to be on kind of a, a path to success if the right people like you. And I think that's what you saw early in Sinbad's career where uh, he was on star search, I think nine times. Yep. Um, he ended up getting a role in red Fox's short lived television show, but he got to work with red Fox and then he got to work with Cosby on a different world where he was a regular. And that was a pretty big show. And uh, by the way, it's also funny. Um, if you go back and I, you can find interviews with like the creators of friends, um, and like Warren Littlefield of NBC talking about creating friend, the show friends. And the, the idea of friends is, oh, well, there's never been a show on television that shows, you know, people in their twenties, just kind of struggling to get by. And the way I think the friends creators phrased it was, um, the time of your life, the time during your life where your friends become your family. Like those are the closest people to you, uh, because you're living with them and you can relate to them because you all have shitty jobs, things like that. And, uh, what the white community didn't realize is that there were a bunch of shows like that, that we just weren't watching <laughs> and a different world is one of those is my point. Like it, they, they were doing what friends claimed to do first, like six years earlier on that show. So. Um, but yeah, that was a Cosby run show, which comes into a little controversy, which we'll talk about later. Um, but that's, uh, kind of the groundwork for Sinbad getting, uh, a lot of notoriety. And then he started hosting, uh, Showtime at the Apollo. So he kept getting these things, um, like we talked about with Martin Lawrence. Now Martin Lawrence went the opposite way with his comedy career, um, as far as the type of material, but it was this thing where Sinbad kept kind of accruing these things where people are seeing them. And it was a time where if you're at, on star search once, then the next day people were like, Did you see that guy? He was pretty funny. And he was on nine times. So these things, you know, kind of kept piling up. He was chipping away at a, a nice resume where people were seeing him. He has a very unique name, you know, so he was standing out at that time. Um, 
So what's the uh, what's the next clip, Craig? Now that we've gotten through all of that, the influence of Sinbad. Uh, yeah. Well, so this is interesting, and I think you know, like I said, um, Sinbad did kind of like. There's a genre of comedy where what you're referring to, whether you know it or not, is Sinbad. And so I think Joey Diaz is talking a little bit about that here. Got on stage in Denver. Everything, everything, every time you went to a room with six comics, they talked about two comics, Roseanne Barr and Sinbad. Why? What was Sinbad? Sinbad supposedly lived in Denver. And he did better. He did a benefit one time, and a bunch of the open the micers went to the benefit. You know, like to be open micers. Uh-huh. And Sinbad said to these open micers, "They said, Sinbad, give us some advice." And Sinbad was like, "Listen, what I need you guys to do is to write clean comedy. Stay away from dirty comedy because you want to be universal and all this shit like this." So all those dudes became anti-dirty. So just like Rogan in Boston, when I started in Denver, everybody was, "Bro, you're too dirty." Like your shit's too dirty. Like yeah. it's too dirty. Like that three, you said three fucks. <laughs> it's too dirty. <laughs> we can't. Because everybody was trying to be fucking Sinbad. Yeah. It's so weird how the heroes from the area uh, define you. You know what I'm saying? You have to figure out what they did, what was different. Like when you read the Sam Kennison book, it's a great read because it tells about Sam and Houston with Carl LeBeau and Bill Hicks. Which is irreplaceable. That's what comedy is all about. Mm-hmm. You getting to the top with your friends. Uh, so I think uh, it's very interesting to hear that kind of perspective because I never really thought about it. But when I heard Joey Diaz saying that, it makes total sense. Where that's why there is the kind of, you know, I think you can think of a pretty stereotypical Boston comedian like those guys you know steve sweeney and lenny clark and don gavin and these guys that all came from this area in the 80s where it was you know excluding stephen wright they all fit a kind of uh personality type like they were tony v they were all these traditional kind of loud mouth boston guys and that's why the culture here is what it was whereas in denver if people like sinbad and roseanne are kind of um you know, the role models in the clubs around there, it's like, oh, we should try and get on television. Uh, and that was probably a more popular road to take at that time because it was, you know, in the 80s, like you had Cosby, Roseanne, then Tim Allen, Seinfeld, Ray Romano, like these comics that essentially their goal was, let me get a sitcom with my name in the title, <laughs> you know, um, excluding Tim Allen, I guess. He didn't have his name in the title, but you know what I mean. Um, so yeah, I, th- I it's interesting. I'll tell you this. I know I uh, ripped Seinfeld in an episode uh, very early on. Sure did. But one thing I do like about his comedy philosophy mm. is he works clean, but he would never tell, um, you know, like a yeah. I think if you if like there's the story of uh, Louis C.K. opening for Seinfeld, where he's like, "What the fuck was that?" <laughs> but if you're opening for Seinfeld, it's a different thing. But if you're just a guy opening and yeah, you, uh, you know, somewhere somewhere along the line, you get to ask Seinfeld for advice. I don't think he would ever tell you be a clean comic. I think he would say, you know, if you are clean, be a clean. And that's something I hear uh, Bargetti talk about a lot, where he's like, yeah, I'm clean, but I don't really curse a lot in my real life. So like, I decided I don't want to be clean. That's how I naturally talk. And that's how I worked. Now, Big J Okerson couldn't be clean. <laughs> right. It's just, it wouldn't make any sense if you look at him. <laughs> right. And, you know, it's just not how he talks naturally. So Sinbad's an interesting case where, based on like the interviews, I don't know that he's necessarily a clean guy. I think he was more strategic in saying, uh, I'm going to craft, because he said early on he did curse a lot. And I think he looked at it and said, you know, the road for me will be. Uh, easier or maybe smart, more uh, fruitful if I work clean. And so I guess that's what I'm talking about with, I think Sinbad was more of a, a businessman, like a great businessman that knew how to make money in comedy rather than a great comedian, you know? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, all right. What else we got? Uh, difficult to work with. Yeah. So this was um, something interesting. 
because I think we might get to sort of the uh, Martin Lawrence conversation. It was interesting because we just did the Martin Lawrence episode a few weeks ago. And honestly, in the 90s, the two guys that ruled comedy or two of the guys, I guess. You could also say, you know, Jim Carrey, Adam Sandler, shit like that. But like in a strictly stand up world, two of the biggest names were Sinbad and Martin Lawrence. Um, and they had similar paths, but very different also. Um, so I think we'll hear a little bit of that in this, uh, his explanation of why he was difficult to work with as well. I feel like you've ever been passed over? Cause I don't, I don't think so. I feel like you've had a, a very great career for a long you know time. What? I'm having my career. No, did I make the crazy money other guys made? No, Hollywood didn't like me. Hollywood never, to this day, never felt me. Oh dude, I was mill- See what happens? They thought. Oh, because I was dirty when I started, but I cleaned it up because I said I want my mother and father to come to the show. But I was still militant. So I got there and they would come talk to me and go like, oh, he's not what we thought he was. I said, oh, I'm not the nice Negro. Mm. So I demand, hey, man, I'm going to get some black camera people. I'm going to make sure some people are here. And then they go like, Simba doesn't work. I said, I wasn't asking you. Mm. And then they go like, remember Lucy was like that. Lucy was hardcore. Lucy she had a Cuban husband. Yeah, yeah, she had a Cuban husband. They put their own studio together. I said, if you believe in something, keep doing it. So I became labeled as difficult to work with. But if diff- like they did more. Yeah, yeah. Like Robert, they did Robert De Niro yeah. told me, if difficult to work with is because you know your craft. And, you, and I knew technology. I was talking about editing. And they looked like I was crazy. This is the 80s. I said, look, man, we get these cameras. We can shoot this. We can edit on set. And they were looking like this. We don't even want him in the room. I didn't notice until later. Man, dude told me, man, you was freaking him out. It's interesting because uh, you hear the advice he got from De Niro. Mm. But there's a line where, like, your talent has to outweigh being difficult to work with. And that's why I use the Martin Lawrence comparison, because I think Martin was so different than a lot of people in that era that it was like, yeah, he might be a pain in the ass to work with, but he's very unique. So we need him. Whereas I think with Sinbad, and like I said, you could credit. Maybe the genre was because of Sinbad. Maybe there were so a lot of people were copying him, but there were a lot of acts not that different from what Sinbad was doing. So I think the more you get a reputation of difficult to work with, the easier it is to cast you out. Now, it's probably not right that people are saying he's difficult to work with. Like if he's a perfectionist and it's his show, then hey, he should be able to get things the way he wants it done, you know? But the problem is when the Sinbad show lasts one season, you can do things that, you know, maybe Jerry Seinfeld gets away with and people are like, well, fuck this guy. You know, the ratings are in the toilet. Why am I listening to him rant and rave? You know? Right. Exactly. Like Roseanne was probably the most difficult person to work with that we've <laughs> talked about, or maybe Jerry Lewis, but both of them crazy successful. So people put up with it, you know, made a lot of money for a lot of people. So you deal That's with right. it. Line their pockets, That's right. Sinbad, is what you got to do. Um, but are we hearing about the Sinbad show next? Yep. Oh, excellent. Yeah, so the Sinbad show lasted um, one season. It was, uh, again, credit to Fox. They were giving people opportunities at this time, um, kind of figuring out what the network was, throwing shit against the wall and seeing what sticks. So uh, a different world is over. And they say, hey, Sinbad, uh, why don't we give you a show? Now, this again, I think if I'm remembering this clip right, goes to why I think Sinbad is a little uh, delusional or maybe misremembers the past. The show cancer and, and I swear, who takes a positive black show? N- yeah. what, ne- what network? What network and wants a positive black show? And you- I don't know. Cosby produced your other show. (laughs) (laughs) But this is where I talk about uh, uh, we're going through a lot of these interviews. I started to notice something with Sinbad. It seems the trend is everything that it wound up failing. He's like, you know, the funny thing is I never even wanted that. (laughs) You know, you know, the hilarious thing about being in that show. I tried to not have it. (laughs) I went out of my way to not get it and they still gave it to me, the sons of bitches. So that's what I'm talking about with Sinbad where there's a little delusion. I would question that. I would question anyone why take the meeting, you know? I would question that anyone is going into a meeting with the the um, objective of tanking it well, the, and the, they're not able to do it. Yeah, you the, know? the best way to not get the show is go in and go I don't want to do this. Yeah, just say don't don't make up this unique thing 
say, uh, yeah, what if I'm a guy with uh, two kids and my wife's kind of uh, annoying? <laughs> They'd be like, well, we got 15 of those. So All he has to do back then, especially, is just pitch a show where he's a closeted gay man. They'll be like, nope. Right. Oh, yes. So pre uh, Will and Grace. Right. We'll, we will not allow that. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I question that. And there's some more things I think will play where it's like, I, I don't know, Sinbad, is that how it happened? <laughs> <laughs> But he thinks very highly of of himself, which is a good thing. Uh, but yeah, he um, this goes kind of back to the difficult to work with thing, right? Problems with the crew. Yeah. So this is um, something he's talking about. And this is more like uh, I, I do believe him here. And it's like, oh, this was probably just a pain in the ass working environment for a lot of people at this time. When I, I got these two producers, I didn't know who they were. They were helping me introduce. I didn't remember back then. They got people with deals. They're trying to get. I didn't realize they knew it was possible. They didn't want me to do it. So it's interesting. I think uh, Ray Romano, from my understanding of it, is a good example of a guy who like, got a show. It's Everybody Loves Raymond. It's based on his life and his act, sort of. But uh, my understanding was basically like Phil Rosenthal was in control of that show. And I think Ray was, you know, kind of okay with that. And so maybe an easier working environment. Whereas the opposite would be Roseanne who they wanted to do that with. They wanted Roseanne to be the star and the face of the show, but you know, kind of control her. And she walked in and said, fuck you. I'm not allowing that. I'm taking over this show. And they were like, ah, shit. But luckily Damn. for Roseanne, the ratings were monstrous. Huge. <laughs> so they were like, all right, we're going to let this bitch, you know, kind of walk all over us with Sinbad. And he's not so much, you know, so Fox will allow people to call you the N word. Apparently, <laughs> 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 if that's the case, again, Martin Lawrence, difficult to deal with. Fox says eh. people like Martin, though, Sinbad show. No one was watching, so they're not going to allow you to come in and take full control. And that's the interesting line. Sinbad walked because, again, he had a lot of these failure failures and he had a lot of movies that we look back on and was like, like, what was it? Uh, he was in first kid, which I think was looked at as like, you know, a kid, he's in a kid's movie. He was in good burger. And I think that stuff kind of hurt him because it's like, Oh, the things he's successful at the things he work that, that work out for him that he's a part of are for children, uh, excluding his stand up stuff. So he's an interesting case in the nineties where he was big purely because of standup. Um, you know, cause I, I, maybe my recollection, I was a kid. So maybe you could say I, I'm wrong about this, but Sinbad wasn't a box office draw. <laughs> he was in some big movies, but it wasn't like, Hey, just say Sinbad had something come out this weekend. Let's hit the theater, you know? Yeah. Good Burger so, wasn't uh, blowing up the box office, really. Right, yeah. So he, uh, you know, he truly was successful from his stand-up, but I don't think we realized what a monster he was. Um, he had three major, major specials come out back-to-back-to-back to back to back years. I think 95, 96, 97, he had hour-long specials come out that did very well. Um, so that's what he was, a, you know, a monster in, more or less. But ended up being diminishing returns on that. And it wasn't uh, able to last long for a few different reasons. Like I said that we will get into, but I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here. No, I think you're right where you're supposed to be. All right. What are we talking? Uh, we're talking mystery movies. Mystery movies. Oh, uh, okay. All right. Well, this is a trend that we've discussed uh, ad nauseum on the blind Mike project. Why does someone, why do many people believe that there is a movie that Sinbad was in. <laughs> I literally would have bet my left arm I've seen this movie. There's a lot of people that would have, and uh, Sinbad will discuss. Well, you got 1995. You got House Guests. You got 1996. <laughs> oh, hold on a second. I like, like Craig saying, hey, I, I would have bet that I've seen this movie. I like that the person interviewing him was just like, hey, this is the list of movies you've got. <laughs> <laughs> you got first kid movie, 1996. Yep. You did another movie, Jingle All the Way. Yeah. 1997. Yeah. Well, a, couple years ago, a couple years ago, my son, 
we did a fake uh, a fake scene, a fake scene for Shazam on, on April Fool's Day. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And nobody picked that up. That was a fake scene with a shirt that I wear on stage. <laughs> so, yeah, the theory is it's a combination of that. Like, Sinbad was friends with Shaq also, so I don't know if they made like appearances together anywhere. They would have been seen in the same place at the same time. I don't know if there was something, you know, recognizable with both of them. But the main theory is that because of the movie Kazam, where Shaq plays a genie, and I guess Sinbad dressed up for an award show as Sinbad the sailor who wears sort of like a turban type thing. And Sinbad is known for the hammer pants that he wore. Uh, the, the, I guess, you know, mix of that got conflated into him being in a movie called <laughs> Shazam. Sinbad also made a video um, where, like, I guess if you're not paying attention, it does kind of look real, where he's confessing. He's like, uh, yeah, I was actually uh, addicted to crack in the late 90s, and I did this movie because I was in a bind. <laughs> 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 he has this whole explanation of why I did the movie Shazam and had it killed, <laughs> but <laughs> it never actually happened, which is it's the, one of the most bizarre phenomenons because people will swear. Now I will say, I think this being like a known part of the Mandela effect has now influenced people like convinced them into believing that they have seen it, you know, like now it's gone so far the other way that people are like, no, I definitely saw it. You know, that's how I felt until we did this probably like six months ago on Blind Mike project where we we spent like a whole episode looking into this. It would have been hilarious if you ripped off, a Shaq movie, which was, you know, universally mocked. <laughs> it would be funny if you ripped off that movie and title. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's just another genie movie. If he wants to make money and at this point of his life, he should just make that movie. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. And I think he would have been a better genie than Shaq. Just make it a PG-13 version. Just make yeah. it funny. Yeah. Um. Well, that may be part of the problem. So... <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah I don't know I like with Gallagher our takeaway was kind of like hey you think you're this funny introspective guy and you don't like people uh, thinking of you as the watermelon smashing guy stop smashing watermelons <laughs> where as I think Sinbad was doing the material he wanted to do I think he liked being a family friendly guy you heard him say earlier <laughs> yeah, I wanted my parents to come to the show that sort of a thing I thought you were literally going to say uh, yeah he, he was the watermelon smashing guy you know so stop smashing watermelons whereas Sinbad everyone's like there's that genie guy but he can't control that <laughs> yeah right <laughs> he has no choice we have labeled him as a genie <laughs> uh, no I think like I think that's how he wants to come off. Cause even like when I've seen him in these interviews with Charlemagne, where he'll kind of, you know, he'll maybe curse a little more and shit like that. Mm-hmm. He's still more or less the same guy. Like that's kind of how he is. And I think he likes talking about relationships and families and all that shit. So it's like, I don't know. You can't really fault him. Uh, part of his problem was, you know, knowing I think when that success might dry up or how far that gets you. So, I think that's uh, where you have a little bit of pride. He wasn't making the money like Martin Lawrence when he faded away was making $15 million of film. Right. And Sinbad just never reached that level. And it was at a time where like, yeah, you probably could have made a shit ton of money do- doing sta- uh, stand up, but not to the level now where like, if Spotify tomorrow takes away Joe Rogan's podcast and his comedy club fails, like we said, uh, he could come to the garden, sell it out and make a couple million bucks, you know? Right. Easily. So that's something they have now that I don't know that even at Sinbad's highest ties, he was necessarily able to duplicate what people were making in the film industry, you know? Yeah, no, he he, uh, uh, he always did a TV show in syndication or something. Yeah, he he, he wasn't even close, right? No, so the Sinbad show lasted one season. Um, even a different world. I I mean, I, I it would definitely get played. I remember seeing it as a kid, but it wasn't something that was rerun the way Home Improvement or Frasier or those shows were. You know, right? Um, what but, was it take for syndication? How many episodes is it? Generally, a hundred is the rule. Yeah, 
Yeah, I know. I mean, would. like, it's not always. That's not uh, uh, written in stone anywhere, but that's usually what they say. It's like the guideline. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, let's keep moving here. Uh, we got uh, top one hundred. Yeah, so this is uh, Sinbad in a matter of, uh, I think, two years in the early 2000s was named to uh, Comedy Central's top 100 comedians ever. And he was also ranked number one on Maxim's worst comedians ever. (laughs) He was ranked the worst. Now, again, that's where I think Sinbad, Carrot Top, these guys, it was easy to mock them because they were out there. But then my argument to that would be there's a reason he's on our television. There's a reason we know who Sinbad is as opposed to someone. Now you can genuinely find the worst comedian ever. Google Dan Ninen and you'll find the worst comedian (laughs) or Tom Myers. But uh, in the 90s, it was a little more difficult. So Sinbad ended up taking a lot of that shit and he became Sinbad's worst yeah, they're like, uh, they're like, yeah, he's the worst comic ever, and he'll be selling out clubs everywhere. That's Sinbad <laughs> had a Nickelback syndrome, where nice, and, and you know, and Dane Cook had this too, where it's like it became Watch funny it. to use him as the reference for someone who sucks. You know, like if you're thinking of a shitty comedian, I don't think Dane Cook. That's for sure. We got it. If you're thinking of a shitty comedian, Sinbad is very easy to get you know, a room full of people to laugh or a viewing audience to laugh. So he became one of those references. Uh, because also because he dressed silly. Yeah. You know, there was a look to him that was uh, mockable. So, you know, he becomes the go-to reference of a shitty comedian. Meanwhile, you could go to your, you know, local theater and not be able to get a ticket if Sinbad's in town. Right. Um, right. But yeah, this is him responding uh, to being on some of these lists, which I found uh, an interesting perspective. Oh. And congratulations, because you were um, one of you were Comedy Central gave you one of the hundred greatest stand-ups man, of weak, all time. That's so weak, man. They put me at seventy-eight. That's the dumbest. Oh, man, no, no, it, it should have been on. I'm like this. Everybody that came before me, prior Cosby, all them guys should have been in front of me. Mm. Nobody beats them. Nobody touches. With the, they were they were the like the greatest of all time, right? But after that list, I'm like, man, I went when I got to like ten, I said, oh, hold up now. <laughs> then I got to twenty, I said, I'm out. I ain't reading no more. Which is so bizarre. I'm pretty sure ahead of him, ahead of him on that list was like Joan Rivers, Don Rickles, <laughs> Rodney, <laughs> you know, Woody <laughs> Allen. Oh, well, makes sense. I don't, I don't know if it was hacks necessarily. So it's hilarious to hear Sinbad, like. In Sinbad's world, you know, like we said, it's easy to make fun of Sinbad, but in Sinbad's world, there's comedians that he looks at and is like, Jesus, this guy was ahead of me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's that confidence so, coming back again. Yeah. So that is funny. And I think that confidence is what a guy like Sinbad needs because, you know, someone with my level of self confidence, if I was going out and doing Sinbad's material, the moment I heard, Anyone make fun of the way I dress. I, I'm wearing jeans the next night. Those hammer <laughs> pants are getting tossed away. <laughs> if you make fun of my act and say it's too family fa- family friendly, I'm trying to get edgy. <laughs> Every time I hear a criticism, I'm changing whatever people hate. <laughs> so I think a guy like Sinbad needs that. You need to be completely, uh, maybe not oblivious, but like numb to any hate that comes your way because it works so well for you. So if you just toss it out, well, then what do you do? Because you're not able to be, you know, I don't think Sinbad had the capability of doing what Martin Lawrence did. So he has to be Sinbad and he has to believe that that's cool, you know? So I think that's important. It's funny to hear him be like 78. (laughs) And then he did the stuttering John thing where he talked about uh, being on Maxim's uh, number one worst comedian. And he's like, well, you know, if I'm the war, if, if you know me as the worst, that means I'm on your radar. I'm doing something right. It's like, well, not necessarily. But, you know. <laughs> 78 but again, all that, time. You know? 78 all time. It's shut up and be thankful. Yeah. 70, uh, 78 all time is ridiculous. I could probably name 78 comedians right now funnier than Sinbad. <laughs> so it's a little crazy to be like, you know, but as far as success, yeah, I think he absolutely belongs on that list. Oh, he'd be higher if it was like all time success. Yeah. Um, so what uh, what are we talking now? 
Things get worse for Sinbad. I'm just waiting for us to fall off the cliff here. Uh, the Cosby defense. <laughs> Oh, well, this might be where we get in. Yeah, so <laughs> Sinbad was conflicted in his later years. Um, it's interesting. You start to wonder, like, after 2000, we didn't really hear a lot of him. Like, the well kind of dried up. Um, not to keep using Dane Cook, but, like, Dane was at the highest of highs. Then when he became a punchline, that's when you stopped hearing his name so much. And I think Sinbad had a lot of that too, where like early 2000s, once people were kind of wise to him and also like once you don't stand out anymore, once it's weird that you're wearing parachute pants with gold earrings and shit, once you've abandoned that because it's out of style, well, you don't stand out anymore. You know, it's interesting. So the well kind of dried up. Now this is, I'm getting off track because this isn't really what that is. This is him uh, kind of grappling. So we talked about uh, Cosby putting him on. He was in an episode of the Cosby show. He was obviously in a different world, which was produced by Cosby. Then I believe he's in a few episodes of Cosby. Like there's a show just called Cosby in the early nineties or in the late nineties, rather um, Then I believe Sinbad was also in a few episodes of, so he has a relationship with this guy who at the time is like, you know, one of the godfathers of comedy. Um, you see the way Seinfeld talks to him in that uh, comedian documentary. Like Cosby is probably on the Mount Rushmore of, of comedy at that time. And whereas he had bad relationships, Cosby did with Eddie Murphy and Martin Lawrence, because he would tell them to, you know, pull your pants up and stop saying the N word. And they would say, well, fuck you. Uh, <laughs> Sinbad was cut out of the perfect Cosby cloth. So he had a real relationship with this guy. Um, so it, it, we hear him here, try and work through some of the allegations that came out later. Let's say what, let's say what the deposition was. Let's get something straight. Okay. He said, I gave women quaaludes. Now we got this. Let's break this down. What he's saying? That's like the modern day person in the late quaaludes is where everybody gathered in the back, men and women. Give me the ludes. Give me some of these ludes who got the ludes. (laughs) <laughs> Who's got the loot? Now, those of you that listen to the Blind Mike Project know that as the Judge Joe Brown defense. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it was interesting. It's like, I guess in that situation, when Cosby's like your guy and you look up to him as like a father figure or something, you just kind of do your best to rationalize. Like, ah, people are just bitching about him giving out drugs, right? That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> like we talked about with Chris D'Elia, where he apologized. He's like, you know, gang. You're right. I shouldn't have been cheating on my wife. (laughs) That's not really what we had the issue with. (laughs) That wasn't the problem. (laughs) So, yeah, I just found that uh, interesting to hear him kind of have to rationalize that, which I'm not even like blaming him for. I think if you know, if you're that close with a guy, you're like, no, no, he wasn't a bad guy. Right. (laughs) Right. right? I I wasn't friends with a monster, you know? (laughs) Yeah. At first I Uh, thought I I was with him until the very end of that because I was like, yeah, he's saying he just gave him drugs. He didn't drug the women. Right. Hey, you take him, you know. <laughs> but that would be like, that would be like a, a. You broke it, you bought it, as they say. Yeah, but that would be like uh, getting pissed at a weed dealer because your cousin smokes pot. This is what Judge Joe Brown said. You're right. Yes. Correct. I'm saying until. Didn't bad and Judge Joe all think this. Until he starts going. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> until until he's like, yeah, they took him on their own. And then you're like, all right, <laughs> so let's stop that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, the 2000s were not uh, great for old uh, David Atkins. Um, things just dried up, you know, like I said, it's the difference of. Like, I think if Seinfeld didn't get his show and kind of adapt to the 90s. Like Seinfeld is very nineties. There doesn't feel like the same, like in the early episodes, I think you can kind of feel the eighties a little bit. And then it becomes very night. Like it's synonymous with the the nineties. Um, and I think it took that to make Seinfeld cool forever, you know, spanning two different decoration uh, uh, decades. Whereas, you know, if he was just the comic that we knew in the 80s, do you ever notice this sort of shit? You think of him as an 80s comic. And I think Sinbad was never able to adapt. He was doing 90s comedy forever. Like, isn't it, Craig, even in, you know, 2009, 
Uh, he kind of disappeared for nine years and he would have these, you know, one, I got the, he was on like an episode of uh, Moesha and shit like that, where he'd have these cameo appearances where you're like, Oh, look at Sinbad. He's really famous, but he never did the next thing. You know, he never found the next jingle all the way or uh, a big movie like that, that he could be in with, you know, a guy like Schwarzenegger, who's a big box office draw and letting everyone see your face. So that causes things to dry up. And then in 2009, when comedy central puts out your special uh, called where you been, you know, a nod to the fact that he's kind of been out of the spotlight for about a decade. Um, and it's still like, boy, I mean, men and women, women are certainly different here. Here's some reasons why <laughs> then it gets like, Oh yeah, no, we've seen this before. Like you, we remember, we got it. Um, so I think that's the, the, the problem that Sinbad really faced, but, um, where are, uh, where are we in his demise now? <laughs> uh, it's always sunny. Oh, okay. Well, this is something that like, again, his timing was bad. Like I said, not bad. Like obviously he had great success, but I think some of these things that he did might like have rejuvenated his career. They were just a weird times like i think if this episode of sunny came out two seasons later maybe because you forget no one was watching the early seasons of always sunny it became a cult classic after and then it became a thing like everyone watches for a while like now um you can quote always sunny episodes the same way you do on uh, arrested development or parks and rec i don't know if i'd put it on the level of seinfeld but it's pretty close You know what I mean? Like people quote it in the same kind of fashion and there are a million me like, uh, uh, you know, the gif or meme of Charlie, um, like the beautiful mind moment where the guy doesn't do uh, Pepe Sylvia, that shit. (laughs) Like that's very popular on the internet, but he had the misfortune of being on always sunny, like a year, maybe two years too early. Uh, so this is cameo where like, He's kind of trying to break that Sinbad mold a little, I think was the intention. Yo, punk. Ow. Wake up. What the hell? Yeah, you in hell, all right. What? You know what? My name is Sinbad. This is Sinbad's house. So I think like a, a cameo like that in a big sitcom like does kind of get you, especially, you know, right at the the brink of like YouTube and social media and shit like that, where stuff gets shared around. I do think there's a way where that kind of gets your name back into the zeitgeist, back into relevant pop culture. But I think Sinbad just missed it. And also like with, I guess, I guess his last uh, appearance that he made in anything was he made a cameo in Atlanta, the Donald Glover show. And now I think we're on the other side of that where it's like a cameo in a TV show, I don't think helps you at all. Cause it's like, yeah, the audience of that show watches it, but like that, that's not everyone. And then even the people that watch Atlanta, some might not see that episode for three years, you know, right. they'll just stream it later whenever they get to it. So like he was kind of on with with those type of cameo appearances, he's kind of on the either side of, of like relevance and never ha- hitting anything in the middle that, like worked for him. I don't think, you know? Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> Atlanta's like a big show, but it's not like, I'm sure there's, well, that's, a what sh- that, that's what I'm saying. Whereas a show as big and as recognized as Atlanta, if he's on that show in 2005, it helps him. Right. You know what I mean? And then I think it legitimately helps him if he has like some sort of standout performance, but, He just missed the timing, I think, on some of those. And so he kept waiting for the big break. Hey, when's someone going to want, you know, when's Tarantino going to want to put Sinbad in a movie (laughs) to rejuvenate his career? And it just never happened. And then so I think stand up gigs kind of dry up. And whereas he had his audience in the 90s it became enough of a joke where it's like you go from maybe theaters to now you're maybe back in clubs in some town, in some cities. Uh, so I think he dealt with a lot of that. And then are we at sort of the financial uh, turmoil he came to? Yep. So uh, he filed for bankruptcy twice. Uh, and 
I'm not going to pretend to know anything about how that works. I know for a lot of people, it just helps you restructure, but I don't think generally if you're filing for bankruptcy, you're in a great place financially. Um, so here's him talking about uh, some of the financial woes he had to deal with. You fit this, this traditional stereotype of black entertainers who get money that you bought. Bentley's. Have you seen? Have you ever seen me the Bentley? Have you ever seen Sinbad with a big chain, dude? This is the same jewelry I've been wearing. I do want to point out that he he does have a pretty good sized chain on. <laughs> I do want to. Point He's like, that you out. think I, it's not like I wear multiple chains like this? <laughs> Just one. Have you ever seen Sinbad with a big chain, dude? This is the same jewelry I've been wearing. This was a present. This is my, my, my wedding ring. This is the same cross. Mm. I don't believe. I do. I can't wear nothing like. Dude, eight hundred thousand dollars. I'd be so nervous. <laughs> 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 That's true. I've seen you on a bunch of times. I've had you. I've never seen you do anything no. extravagant. You, no. you didn't even tip. I, I do tip. <laughs> I tip good though. I'm known for my tip. Right, right, right. Cash running my tip. What's up? Right. <laughs> so when I went bankrupt, they go sit at the counter, please. Right. So <laughs> pay first. <laughs> so my thing is, I never believe. I don't need Ben. I don't need do four hundred thousand dollars for a car. Yeah. And these kids can't go to four hundred thousand and you leased it. Right. Oh yeah, no, that's a bad no, look. no. So you just invested in yourself. Just my family, my business, my people, equipment. I believe me. You have get, you have your own stuff. And remember, cameras were expensive. Computers were dude. You can buy a camera. You can buy an iPhone and shoot a movie now. Oh, I wish I was eighteen. <laughs> Oh God, I can't, when somebody come to me, man, how do you make this business? Fool, if you haven't figured this out, I'm not even gonna tell you. Right. If you can't figure out how to make it now, you're just a baby. Yeah. You're a wimp. Yeah. Punk. <laughs> I don't even understand the part of the end there. The punk. <laughs> if you can't make it uh, in, in this era, you're a failure. Here's why I didn't make it in this era. <laughs> 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 I don't really get what he's talking about. Well, I think like, I think he means that he's too old to do it now or make it. Oh, maybe, I guess. But that was the vibe uh, I got. Well, yeah. Oh, that's another thing he had, like a Netflix show. I think his son produced a Netflix show called Rel with him in it, which I assumed involved a little Rel, but it did not apparently, which is odd. <laughs> but uh, that only lasted one season, so he had these little opportunities that just never. Never really stuck. And, you know, I think part of it is you hear his confidence there where it's like he kept thinking, oh, the next movie is right around the corner. Surely someone is going to want Sinbad. You know, what's weird to me is that Sinbad and even like just when you listen to him talk, it's like I feel like he could have had Steve Harvey's career. Mm. You know what I mean? There's no reason Sinbad couldn't have been hosting the family feud and had some dumb talk show or radio. Like he seems like an interesting enough charismatic guy that he could have been doing something like that. And even, I think he did, he had some like late night show on UPN in the early two thousands that didn't work. Uh, again, he would have these things. I'm, I am surprised because he's a likable enough guy that at least something at that level didn't work out for him where he's hosting a successful game show or something, but that might be, I don't know if it's his you know, pride got in the way where he was thinking, no, I'm a movie star now, but whatever it was, he never, he was not able to sustain that success. And then obviously his financial troubles caught up to him in like 2000. I think he filed in, 2009 and 13, I believe. Oh, it was that close together? Yeah, which I assume, again, I assume is not good, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and that close together is not great. <laughs> I don't know what you do in four years to go bankrupt again, but... He he filed for bankruptcy, then put all his money into, uh, you know, the, the rebirth. <laughs> Something else that failed, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, and then, uh, you know, he also dealt with a lot of uh, health troubles, uh, is that where we're going now? Uh, this is a stand-up clip uh, about a stroke. Yeah, so this is him. Uh, it's always weird when you hear guys kind of foreshadow their lives like this. But this is him talking about, uh, you know, oh, what the type of woman you would want around. And all you men out here, 55 years old, trying to date some girl 20 like she like you. Are you out your mind? <laughs> she wants your house. <laughs> I don't see no 20 year old girls with a broke down 55 year old man with no money. You don't see no girl 20. Oh, he's, look, look at the homeless dude, but he's cute. Hey, hey. She wants you to die. If you keep messing with her, you will. You want a woman that understands the signs of stroke. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> A woman that got my medication in her purse. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. 
I thought you took it. I thought I did. You want a woman that's your nurse. See, if you go to dinner with a woman that's 55 years old and you, your little lip curl up, she know what to do. Hey, 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 hey. Jamal, Jamal, look at me. Jamal, look at me. She'll get you to a hospital and save your life. But a girl 20, quit making faces at me. It's not funny anymore. Now you all stroked out for the rest of your life because your little cute girlfriend didn't know the signs of stroke. Well, you actually, I, didn't, I don't think I noticed it when I was watching shit for the episode, but like, you can definitely hear the Cosby influence there. Yeah. Like big time. <laughs> that, were, that honestly wasn't a terrible clip. No, no, no. Well, that's, that's what I wanted to show about uh, Sinbad is like, I don't think he was a bad comic. I just think he, you knew what he was going to talk about. You know, he's going to talk about the difference between black people and white people, the differences between men and women. Isn't it crazy to have kids? That's sort of like you knew what material right. was coming more or less. And you had heard it from other people. I, did, I just like the way he was like, she wants your house. <laughs> that was, that was well, that, that, and that's what I'm saying is like, I don't think he was a bad stand up. I just don't think he was a great stand up either. So when the pool of, you know, 10 million people talking about their marriages came, you had to be different. Right. You know, like Louie was one of the first people to be like, I just, I fucking hate my kid. Like I think about killing my children sometimes, <laughs> you know, like you had to go that way with it to have material about your children that stood out. And so I think that that was Sinbad's issue is he just stopped um, standing out. Now, even his best stuff, isn't something that I would necessarily pay for, but you know, neither is fucking Jeff Dunham, <laughs> you know, but the guy sells out, uh, theaters. I feel like we need like, uh, there's going to be like a year buffer for us to say, like, I don't think I'd pay for that. Cause we did just go see Shab. So <laughs> well, there's a difference to it. Yes. If I <laughs> spend hours breaking down Sinbad's comedy, <laughs> then we'd have to go see him the next time he came around. <laughs> yeah. We have no choice. I'm not going to shop alone, <laughs> but that's the thing. I don't think Sinbad is the, Sinbad being as famous as he was is not the equivalent of someone like Brendan Schaub who has genuinely bad material. Right. It's just material that you're like, nah, some of this, I've heard that perspective before. He invented the perspective though, probably. Um, I'm just trying to defend him. I don't fucking know. <laughs> no. Yeah. Like I said, I think it's, it's Cosby ish stuff. You know what I mean? I think it's stuff that Cosby was kind of doing um, back in the day. And that a lot of comics did in the seventies and eighties. And I think it just died out. And the fact that for a while he was like an alternative to, you know, some of the crazy edgy stuff that was going on at that time. And I think that eventually just fizzled out because there were enough options where even people that liked clean comedy were like, I don't need Sinbad necessarily, you know? Right. He went, he went bank. You know, I'm just looking into his bankruptcy right now. Yeah. Uh, he went bankrupt while having a $16,000 monthly income. Jesus. He claimed really? he couldn't pay his bills. Well, so a lot of it, I guess, was back taxes. There were a couple conflicting numbers. Um, I saw in the state of California, he owed like $2.6 million in back taxes. And then there was another number to throw out that he said was not true, uh, where it was reported he owed $8 million in back taxes. I was going to say, um, it says he owes roughly $11 million to various creditors. Yeah. Um, and uh, most are owed to back taxes for years twenty. 2009 to 2012 in the amount of 8 million, which that seems like a lot for just yeah, so pay your taxes, kids. It'll catch up with you. Yeah. And then it's like, he was American express 375 grand. Jesus. How do people find this out? Um, if you file, is it public record? Maybe. I don't know. I have no idea. That seems, yeah, I don't know. That would be an insane thing to do, but yeah, but he had, <laughs> yeah, he had his, uh, he had his struggles with that. And then as you know, you heard in that clip, maybe a little foreshadowing because in the last couple of years, he's dealt with some health issues. Unfortunately, I guess in the episode of Atlanta, he was in, he didn't look very well and he had been dealing with health, health issues for 
kind of a long time. And then it all culminated um, a few years ago. What is his condition right now? He's in the process. This is from Entertainment Tonight. Yes. Learning to, to walk and talk, learning to enunciate words and and get his mobility back. I spoke exclusively today with Sinbad's longtime friend, Phyllis Johnson, after his family released these heartbreaking photos of his secret struggle. The 66-year-old was given a 30% chance of survival. Well, we see him in the hospital on a ventilator. We see him working with the walker at physical rehab center. Was there concern that he might not make it? Yeah, I think I think that's a concern that everybody had. Now he's just he's on the road to recovery. Why did he decide to tell fans about the condition now? I think, you know, Sinbad's very private. He just wanted to wait until he was ready to be at a place and time where he felt comfortable explaining. Sinbad's family set up a website asking for donations, quote, the cost of therapy far exceed what insurance covers. Especially when I guess he doesn't have any money left. Like that fucking is brutal, I imagine. Yeah, and apparently this was a terrible stroke because just this November there's a story, um that picture I think that pic this actually might have been from this. Yeah. But the stroke happened two years before that picture of him trying to learn how to walk. Yeah, he's at a he's at a rough go of it. So uh, thoughts and prayers go out to the great Sinbad because you know, it's just a shame he was never able to figure out how to su- sustain that success. But like when I was growing up, everyone knew who Sinbad was. Like if you said the name Sinbad, you might not have been a fan of his. You might have thought of him as a hack or whatever. But there was no one that didn't know. You couldn't say Sinbad with and have someone go, "Who are you talking about?" Right. You know, everyone knows he, that name. He surpassed a mythical sailor. So <laughs> exactly. He took over that name. Like he chose the name of someone that existed and he took over that name. He became Sin. If you Google Sinbad, he's coming up first. Oh, for sure. <laughs> um, so, I mean, yeah, crazy successful. Um, not, one, I, I, not one of the most exciting characters we've covered, but I think definitely an important one. I, I kind of like looking at looking back at those guys and giving them a little credit for what they did. Um, maybe it didn't always work out. I, it sounds pretty rough for Sinbad. Hopefully he's able to make some kind of comeback, but based on the way it was described, it doesn't seem like it's in the cards. I don't know how much we'll hear from Sinbad in the coming years. Yeah. Cause we need to see the movie Shazam. We need it to get made. And I'm still yes. not, I'm still not completely hundred percent convinced that it's not out there. <laughs> it might be better to make now with him. You get three wishes Sinbad. What are they? <laughs> it's Shaq. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, you know, thoughts and prayers go out to Sinbad and uh, the Atkins family. Um, Because, yeah, like he he is one of the most successful guys ever. So he deserves, you know, some sort of tribute if you're talking about the history of comedy. Um, So, you know, I hope we uh, filled you in on any questions you might have had about Sinbad. And uh, if you want bonus episodes, if you say, Mike, you know. I, I wet my whistle here a little bit, but now I want you to, you know, slide all the way in. Good Joe Matarese part two is up on uh, the Patreon right now. And the best way to find the Patreon or our merch gearhead, why are you laughing and blind Mike project merch, uh, as well as the free links to the podcast, Apple, Spotify, YouTube. Um, then go to blindmike.net. That's blindmike.net. Don't confuse it with anything else. People try to add my last name. They add the show title. None of that nonsense. They add .com. You're incorrect. It's blindmike.net. So for those of you that are telling you otherwise, they're wrong. Yes, because we have a wide net over things we cover. That's That's right. right. It's .net. Sure. Yes, remember it that way. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, go to blindmike.net, support the show, and uh, why are you laughing? Bonus content will be aplenty in January. Um, so hopefully you sign up for that and uh, you can go to very good show.org Ooh. to check out what the Craigster is doing. Yeah. Go buy merch, go buy our Patreon, uh, listen to us for free, leave Plenty reviews, all that fun stuff, fun yes. stuff. Uh, do all that. Thank you guys for supporting the show. Thanks for sticking with us past 2022 and into the new year. And we will talk to you guys next time on. Why are you laughing? 
Oh, so I screwed up here, huh? Yeah. All right. Yeah, we have one more clip to get to, folks. Um, I, silly me. <laughs> How could I have forgotten this? We have one more clip because we have to get in uh, a mention of the great Norm MacDonald. And you might be thinking, Mike, how could you work Norm MacDonald into an episode about Sinbad? And I would say very easily. Uh, This is his appearance on Mark Maron, where he tells a story of the first time he met Sinbad. But uh, so I got my five minutes just at rote. That's the way I used to do comedy. I'd memorize every fucking word. And so I had it all figured out and shit, right? And so then I go there, I meet Sinbad, right? <laughs> so I, I didn't know who Sinbad was. And he goes, uh, and we, he's completely relaxed. I'm all he's wearing thinking about him. Some sort shirt. of one piece outfit. <laughs> he, did. Yeah. <laughs> he did. Uh, his hair matched his uh, shirt. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, they were both orange. Yeah. Yeah. So then he said, uh, <laughs> he was just so relaxed and he said, uh, hey, let's go. I got to get some socks. So we go to this fucking store, right? When we first go into the store, there's yeah. no one there. It's a yeah. small store. So there's no one there. The lady's in the back. Yeah. So the lady takes a minute to come out. Yeah. Uh, and he's like, where's that lady? You know, there's nobody here, you know? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and so she, he comes out, he gets his fucking socks. <laughs> Nothing happens, right? So then that night at the gala, yeah. I do my carefully constructed material. Yeah. Sinbad comes out. He goes, what the fuck is going on? No, he doesn't swear. He goes, yeah. what's going on with these stores with socks? <laughs> I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> and then he's like, you go in the store and, uh, they don't, there's no one there. And then people are agreeing with him. I'm like, what? <laughs> it didn't make any, it's never made any sense except that he destroyed and I didn't. Uh, that's when I realized that, uh, that I was missing a whole bunch of stuff. Cause I guess at first you think you're good and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> so that, there you go. Sinbad and impact on Norm's career. And realize he has to, you know, tighten his material. <laughs> I just like the add-in of like they're agreeing with him. <laughs> yes, we get our socks at stores. Also, I like when he's like, yeah, he said, yeah, yeah. You go in, and they don't come out, and he's like, what? <laughs> You're like, yeah, uh, shame on me. I should have known we didn't end with the stroke material. I should have remembered <laughs> that we had some norm stuff. Um, so are we just leaving this in the way it is? Yeah, sure. Why not? All right. So you know where to go. Blindmike.net. We already said all that stuff. And uh, we'll talk to you guys next time on Why You Laughing.